The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Workers are also voters, and after some very trying times, that fact is not lost on the parties in this Ontario election. We'll find out tonight how the platforms court the Labour vote and whether it redraws any long-standing battle lines. Then, Nam Kiwanuka talks to author Stephen Dale about his book that explores Hamilton's choices for its post-industrial urban future. It's Tuesday, May the 10th, and that's ahead on the agenda. In the depths of the pandemic, wages, sick leave, and emergency pay sometimes meant disparate voices singing from a similar hymn book. However, now that it's election time, the differences among the parties that remained and their promises for the recovery to come give both unionized and non-unionized workers much to consider. Let's find out more. And as is our custom here, we're going to introduce our guests from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in the nation's capital with Angela McEwen. She's senior economist at CUPE National. In Hamilton, Ontario, Joe Mancinelli, Lyona International Vice President and Regional Manager. In the downtown core of the provincial capital, Rocco Rossi, President and CEO of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. And in North York, Lori Nanskavel, First Vice President and Treasurer of OPSU, the Ontario Public Service Employees Union. And it's great to have you four on our program for a look at who's going to win the Labour vote in this campaign. And before we dive into the four major party platforms, just to get your feedback on those, let's just do a little background here. Joe Mancinelli, to you first. How successful do you think the current government has been in courting the Labour vote? Well, Steve, I think they've been very successful. Uh, I think Monty McNaughton, in particular, Minister of Labor, has done an exceptional job of working very closely with uh, a number of the skilled trades and a number of the other unions right across uh, the province. So, you know, his track record is impeccable, probably one of the uh, best labor uh, ministers and ministers of skills and development that we've had in a long time. Angela McEwen, what would you say? I'd have to say that the record is is uh, very different for workers who aren't in the skilled trades. Um, I would say they cut the minimum wage as soon as they were came into office, and so that that hurt low wage workers. They got rid of equal pay for uh, part time workers, temporary workers. They've recently carved gig workers out of employment standards. Uh, so there are a whole bunch of workers. They they have Bill 124, which is limiting uh, total compensation increases in the broader public sector to 1% increases when inflation in Ontario is 7%. Uh, and these are workers who've been on the front lines, education workers, healthcare workers. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, that uh, while they may uh, have created some jobs building highways, Broadly, uh, we wish they'd have built something else. Let me ask well, Lori Nanskavel. could have created jobs for the trades. Right. More to come on that. Lori Nanskavel, uh, you, you represent OPSU, which, of course, uh, represents so many people in the Ontario Public Service. How do you think this government has done in terms of its relationship with Labour? Thanks. I think that the Ford government's claim to be working for workers uh, is really just talk, and their actions don't support that. Ontario spends less per capita on public services than any other province, and we've had the fewest hospital beds per capita of the province, and we're tied actually with, with Mexico, with the lowest hospital beds in the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. Funding to school boards fell by $800 per student over the four years. And the PC government scrapped the minimum wage when they first came into office and made workers wait years for that to be increased. They also paid private companies $22.4 million to run a, a paid sick leave program instead of providing permanent paid sick days. And WSIB under Ford will provide $1.5 billion in surplus funds back to employers at the expense of injured workers. So we really don't feel as though the Ford government has been here for workers. All right. Rocco Rossi, you're kind of, as the head of the Chamber of Commerce, our sort of designated voice of business here. And I, I guess I should ask you off the top, the Progressive Conservative Party traditionally has been seen as the sort of pro-business party in the province of Ontario among all those on offer. Uh, has that been the case under Doug Ford, in your view? Well, there's no question that there have been many positive uh, developments despite uh, very difficult 
um, last two years. Um, but um, I, I think at the end of the day, what all parties have to answer is how we're going to grow. Um, because so long as we continue to trail all of the Great Lakes states uh, by some $16,000 per capita in economic production, we simply will not be able to uh, grow services and wages to the level that all of us would love to see. Uh, and so the focus really needs to be on how we improve productivity, how we grow as an economy to be able to achieve uh, the goals that we all want. Do you think this government spent enough time thinking about that, Rocco? I think there's never enough time spent on that, uh, quite frankly. Um, and, uh, and so we continue to push on a number of, uh, on a number of fronts. And clearly, uh, the pandemic was an extraordinary time, and it is by no means um, much as we'd all love it to be in the rearview mirror, there are still uh, enormous impacts uh, that continue to be felt and that need to be taken into account as we think about any new uh, cost increases in the face of existing um, pressures that have already been um, laid out in terms of inflation uh, and other cost increases. All right. With all of that background in place, let's now take a look at the four-party platform, starting in order of precedence in the last House, therefore with the Progressive Conservative Party. And Sheldon, if you'd bring this graphic up, we can go through this. Now, of course, the parties have got a lot to say. We're just putting up some of the bullet points here in the PC plan. $114.4 million over three years for what they're calling a skilled trades strategy. Increase the general minimum wage to $15.50 an hour on October 1st of this year. Expand college degree granting in applied fields. $15 million plus over three years in the Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program. And of course, they got $25 billion for highways in there as well, which will presumably pr provide a lot of work for a lot of people. Joe Mancinelli, up to you first again. What do we think of this PC plan? Well, you know, clearly representing 90,000 construction workers in the province of Ontario and being the largest construction union in the country, you know, clearly that kind uh, of uh, infrastructure dollars being injected into the economy is very favorable for our, our, our members and their families. So very important information that's come out of that. And previous information that we received uh, earlier on, like the $40 billion for hospitals and long-term care facilities and a number of other uh, 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 projects like $23 billion towards schools as well. Very, very important because, you know, during the pandemic, it was a construction industry that kept on working, keeping the economy going. And we just need to keep on going in order to inject funds into the economy uh, because the ripple effects uh, affect not just construction workers, it affects the corner store uh, at the corner and, and, and other manufacturing and a whole bunch of other things that our members purchase as well. Angela, there's one labor leader of significance who gives a thumbs up to this current government. What say you? And I, I think that um, when, when his members are having jobs created, that makes absolute sense, right? from a broader economic analysis, I think that if we're concerned about productivity and productivity growth, we should look at what those jobs are created. So I absolutely support uh, investing in infrastructure and creating those jobs for those construction workers, but let's do it with the biggest bang for our buck. So rather than using uh, public-private partnerships that cost more over the long term and deliver less, let's do, build it publicly. So rather than public-private partnerships for highways, Let's build publicly owned hospitals, schools, child care centers. Let's use that money to build public long-term care homes. We saw during the pandemic, private long-term care homes actually had much worse outcomes for workers. So let's focus on what we know works and what we know is actually more affordable over the long run, which is public infrastructure. Um, and the, the other piece, I think, is that um, it's obviously not just uh, those skilled trade workers that we need to work about, worry about if we're thinking about productivity. Education is huge for productivity. So kindergarten to grade 12, last year they underspent the education budget by $1.3 billion. If we're concerned about productivity, we need to be investing in youth, we need to be investing in post-secondary education, whether that's for apprenticeships 
or for universities, that's how we grow our economy and that's how we get a, a, a more productive future for everyone. Rocco, maybe I'd direct you towards the provisions for minimum wage there, which uh, the government says will go up to 15.50 an hour. Of course, uh, more to come on the other parties on that regard. But do you think that will act as a disincentive for business to hire more people if that were to take place? Look, the, the vast uh, majority of our members uh, pay well in excess of the minimum wage already. Uh, and there is a war for talent out there. So um, it's rarely the arbitrary level that's set by any government. Um, the, the market really sets uh, what, what you're going to need to pay in order to get uh, the workers. What we need to be focused on is how do we build an economy where there are as few minimum wage jobs as possible? And that, and I agree with, with Angela, look, um, education is crucial. Apprenticeship is crucial. Um, I wish I had known uh, when I was going through school that uh, one day OPG would be paying welders at the Darlington refurbishment between 150 to $200,000 a year. Um, skilled trades are a phenomenal pathway um, to real middle class existence that can afford houses, et cetera. And the work that Joe and his members um, do on the training front to really lift up particularly underrepresented groups, whether it's indigenous, whether it's women in trades, um, is really going a long way to making a fundamental difference um, in the, the life that we want for all of our friends, family, and neighbors. Lori, how about you on this PC plan? Thoughts? Thanks. I think some of it is too little, too late. <laughs> of course, we'll take any increases to minimum wage, but really, <laughs> had the plan be struck from the get-go, they would have been far better off than they are right now. Infrastructure does need to happen. So similar to what we've heard already from Angela, I do support that. But I think when you're looking at public services and public sector, we all need public services. And that is so critically underfunded that it really needs to be a focus for this government. And it's not. So we need a government that will provide the focus and dedication to our public services. Well, we'll see if any of the other parties uh, meet that test as we go on to talk about them. Actually, you know what? Hang on a sec. Before I leave the PCs, I do have to ask one last question, and that is, who do I want to put this to? Okay, Joe, I'm going to pick on you for this one here. Do you not see something kind of ironic in the fact that many of the policies that Doug Ford is running on right now, he opposed in the first two years of his premiership, and in fact, many of these policies, which the previous government had brought in, uh, you know, he overruled in the first couple of years of his premiership. What do you think? Well, you know, to be fair, I think any government that comes into office has to assess, you know, where their priorities are. And, you know, if you look at a number of the labor bills uh, that have to do with skills development, uh, apprenticeship, infrastructure, et cetera, uh, clearly they had to listen uh, to the public and to organizations like ours, like Leuna in order to assess what their priorities are. And so in all fairness, you know, in the very beginning of their campaign, they opposed certain things and then changed their minds. And I'm actually quite happy uh, that, I mean, that the Ford government, uh, Doug Ford and, uh, and Monty McNaughton listened very carefully uh, to the needs of uh, Ontario workers. And I'm quite happy with that. Angela, do I hear you trying to get in there? Yeah, sorry. Uh, so they they cherry picked uh, what they reversed on. So they they increased the minimum wage, but they left out the key pieces like equal pay for temporary workers or for part time workers. And so they're still leaving behind a whole bunch of workers. Um, they're they're taking money out of the WSIB fund for injured workers. So. They've picked some workers that they've decided, you know, to try to help them, I think, make them look better, to, to try to make this show, this mirage, that they're worker friendly. Um, but they've really only cherry picked a few workers uh, to do that. And they, they've really left the left of us, lots of us behind. If you talk to any healthcare worker or any education worker, this government has done nothing for them. Uh, they're overworked, they're underpaid, uh, they're stressed out. Um, they keep getting promises made, like the personal support workers that were promised a $3 increase. There was a bill passed, rushed through uh, the House, and there's nothing in that bill that actually increases wages. 
for personal support workers. So they've had these promises made and then their hopes dashed. Okay, so over and over in. again, we've seen these huge promises uh, that aren't fulfilled. Okay, I, I'm gonna jump in because I do wanna make sure that we get enough time to talk about all the platforms. So let's move on and talk about the NDP platform at this point. And again, I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osman, to bring the graphic up where the NDP plans to raise the minimum wage to $20 in the year 2026. 10 permanent personal emergency leave days for all workers is a part of the NDP plan. They would create Ontario benefits to cover all workers, including those in part-time, casual, app-based, or contract jobs, the so-called gig economy. And they would repeal Bill 124, which is, of course, this bill that was so controversial in as much as it holds public servants to a maximum of 1% wage salary compensation uh, in collective bargaining. Uh, okay, Rocco Rossi, to you first. What do you think of what you've heard here? Well, uh, look at on um, the sick days, um, as you know, uh, Steve, during the pandemic, we at the Ontario Chamber of Commerce supported um, the initiative for, for 10 um, days because we're facing a pandemic, so long as it was government uh, paid, taxpayer paid. Um, and that's a crucial element um, because, quite frankly, just as not all workers are alike, not all businesses are alike, not all businesses have the margins that RBC or Amazon or Shopify have. Um, and so if this is intended as a social safety net, um, then it needs to be publicly funded so that it's paid for on the basis of um, a, a progressive income tax as opposed to hitting those who can least uh, afford it. Um, on, the, uh, on the $20, um, while, while the, uh, the sticker shock is a big one for uh, many smaller uh, members in our, um, in our chamber network, um, one thing I will grant uh, the NDP on it is that they're talking about predictable increases over time uh, to get to uh, that that level. And I think that is a key thing that we ask of all uh, parties is build it on the basis of tied to economic growth. Unfortunately, not just to inflation, much as I would love inflation to be solved by picking a, um, a, a number where you would put wages. The problem is if you don't get productivity increases, all that's gonna do is increase inflation further and you just end up on a, on a wheel that doesn't move anyone further ahead. But be predictable so that people can plan um, and can build it in over time because it's suddenness and unpredictability, which is the enemy of business investment. Lori, your view on the NDP offer. Thanks. I think it makes sense. I think that this is what looks out for the best of workers. When we're talking about the $20, um, as just mentioned, it, it's a progressive increase and the economy is going to improve when you pay people, when you pay working class people more. We are going to be spending the money back into the local economies and you're going to start seeing it back in your businesses. When you pay rich people more money, <laughs> it, it doesn't stay here. <laughs> it, it, it uh, you know, another yacht or going into the coffers that you have offshore or something else. But when you pay working class people, you're going to see that money come back. So I think that is the absolute right thing to be doing with the NDP. Out of the curiosity, Lori, sorry, out of yes. curiosity, do you, does OPSU intend to endorse the NDP in this campaign? We support the NDP. Because your uh, predecessor, Smokey Thomas, I don't think ever, ever did, but it, there's a new sheriff in town and is the new there sheriff going to? Yeah. The new sheriff is going so to say Opsu endorse. So Opsu doesn't endorse any political party, but we do support the NDP. Gotcha. Okay, Joe Mancinelli, your view of the NDP campaign? Well, it's hard to argue um, with any of the points there, and I, I just want to make it very clear that Leuna's on record as opposing Bill 124. Uh, we feel that all workers should have the right to negotiate through a collective agreement and come up with a. Uh, a, a a monetary agreement that makes sense. You know, 1% is not enough, and we're all experiencing the hardships of inflation right now, uh, unprecedented levels of, of inflation. That requires a lot more than 1% in order to even to just be level, uh, let alone get an increase. So, you know, we're, we're not in favor of 124, but, but I still believe that 
Um, the Doug Ford government is going to win the next election. And, you know, we have to be ready to talk to them and convince them uh, that 124 is not the answer and and move on. And, and the rest of the stuff, I mean, it's very difficult for me to argue. And people getting an increase, even, you know, uh, uh, folks at $20 an hour. Uh, but then again, you know, Rocco makes a good point. You know, the marketplace is the marketplace. And there's small business that get affected if, in fact, it moves too quickly. And I think you really got to assess the economics when you're making these kind of increases. And if they're incremental, it works. If it's too fast, it doesn't work. It actually has a negative effect on the economy. Since I asked Lori, I should ask you as well. Does, the, does Leuna intend to endorse any political party or candidate or leader formally? We have endorsed Doug Ford. There you go. It's on the record. Angela, your view on the NDP campaign offer for labor. Yeah, I think that the the minimum wage plan in particular is really smart in terms of the economics of it. Uh, the the research shows that solid, uh, you know, the slow, uh, gradual increase in the minimum wage allows businesses to plan. It also, as Lori said, uh, puts money into workers' pockets and they spend that in their local communities. So that's actually a really solid way to increase uh, economic growth is to put money in workers' pockets. At, the, at that level. But I think beyond these promises, I think the issue that workers are really concerned about is affordability. Um, they're concerned about housing prices. They're concerned about rent. They're concerned about the cost of, of health care and wait times in health care. And so I think that the ND plan, NDP plan on all of these fronts is actually quite a bit better, especially in terms of, you know, building not-for-profit affordable housing that creates jobs, um, that puts those Lyuna construction workers to work, and it gives us um, somewhere for people, somewhere to live that they can afford. And so all of these pieces, I think, you know, the dental care these are really important in terms of affordability. If you're thinking about uh, public services and and being able to provide those services to people rather than them having to pay out of pocket, uh, that makes life more affordable for people. And that is is game changing for uh, regional economies to, to grow and be stable and make it through. You know, we don't know what's coming with the with the war in Ukraine and, and potentially a recession. So. So we want these types of investments that keep the economy stable uh, as we're going forward. And Angela, does QP intend to formally endorse any candidate or party in this election? So I'm pretty sure. So I'm with QP National, so we wouldn't. Um, but I'm pretty sure QP Ontario uh, has has reviewed the parties, had looked at the values um, that are expressed by each of the parties, and, and they're behind uh, the NDP. Yeah. Okay. Laurie, let me do one last follow-up with you on this, and that is uh, a couple of things. Uh, the, the NDP have made it a point to say gig workers ought to be included in some of the uh, other benefits that go to other more permanent workers in society. And uh, I guess I want your take on whether that goes far enough and whether the NDP minimum wage goes far enough, given that, um, you know, it's, I, I think it's 22 bucks an hour is, the, is considered the living minimum wage in, for example, the city of Toronto. So, uh, okay, you're endorsing the NDP, but do they go far enough for you in those two main areas? Yeah, we do support the NDP. I think that there's always room to do better. Uh, we do support, we want people to have cost of living and to be able to have a living wage. However, we do have to get there in stages. So I support that this is the party that is going to help get us to where we need to be. I think with gig workers as well, any improvements are good improvements and the NDP has the fastest track, I think, to represent these Sorry, not to represent, but to support these members in that process. Okay, let's get the Liberal plan up next, please, Sheldon. Here is what the Liberal Party of Ontario has on offer in terms of labour. They would increase the minimum wage to $16 an hour, so a little bit beyond what the PCs are promising, create 150,000 jobs by getting 1.5 million new homes built, tackle the gender pay gap by requiring pay transparency, and test out this idea of a four-day work week. A four-day work week. Okay. Pick on anything you like there, Rocco Rossi. What do you think? Well, first of all, I just want to go back to something that was said earlier. I can't let it stand. Um, um, you know, reducing the debate to we can't give money to people with yachts uh, is really not helpful at all. Tens of thousands of small businesses went bankrupt over the last two years through no fault of their own. They've lost their houses. They've lost their mortgages. They've suffered through this. You've got hundreds of thousands of small, medium-sized businesses 
that have added almost $200,000 in debt over this period of time. So let's have a real debate. Let's have the full context. And this simple-minded characterization is really offensive. Um, Rocco, in I terms have to say it's offensive the, as well to hear back what you're saying to me. Nowhere did I say all businesses. I spoke about those with yachts and those of the 1%. Which That's are so small, about. which are so small and are not the people and are not the people that are being truly affected by yeah, uh, she didn't by the changes. So let's, I let's never make said sure that, okay. Rocco. I understand. I think both of you have made your points on this. Rocco, to the Liberal plan, what do you see that you like or don't like? Well, one of the things that's quite interesting is on the, on the minimum wage, what they're actually talking about, and uh, they haven't provided any detail on it, um, but is to have regional variability because it understands that um, the cost of living is not the same in every part of the, the province. I'm not sure how that actually um, would work, but it's, a, it's an intriguing um, notion. And the, the portable benefits piece is something that we're hearing really all of the parties um, begin to, um, uh, to talk about. Uh, and that is something that I think that is very much worthy of uh, of study and and look at how to make it uh, how to make it work because labor mobility is a key part of getting to a higher productivity in the economy. And so what you don't want is people is is friction ca caused in the economy because people are worried, well, if I go to this, uh, what happens and is benef are benefits covered, et cetera. So um, I think there's a case that can be uh, can be built, but we'd like to see a lot more detail on that. Okay. Uh, just to let everybody know, running out of time, so if you could keep your comments nice and economical, I'd appreciate it. Joe Mancinelli on the Liberal plan, your view. Well, I think it's a weak plan. Uh, there's nothing much that is significant uh, in their plan. Part of the problem, uh, too, is a matter of trust. You know, when it comes to the Liberals, and, and we saw this uh, with uh, the Wynn government and the Del Duca government, um, they they don't stick to their word. And, and in fact, you know, they can even uh, make it much better than they even have uh, presented to us. And at the end of the day, it's a matter of trust. I'm not so sure I believe anything that they say. And, and at the end of their term, uh, Del Duca was part uh, of the movement to take jurisdiction away from Leon and hand it over to another organization. Uh, that is something so distasteful that, unfortunately, the 90,000 members we have and the 300,000 members of their families uh, can't forget. I'm glad you put that on the record because people should understand that your union and Mr. Del Duca's former union, the Carpenters, also have a bit of history there. So, okay, there's that in place. Angela, your view on the liberal plan? Yeah, there's, it's, uh, it looks nice. Uh, I think the issue is trust. There's Bill 115, where they interfered in collective bargaining with education workers. There's the fact that we had the fewest hospital beds per capita under this liberal government. There's the fact that they haven't increased, you know, Ontario Works or ODSP. They let it uh, deflate to the two absolutely an abysmal level right now. Uh, so the history of that liberal government isn't that far away. And we had to drag them kicking and screaming to increasing the minimum wage right at the end of that term. So any increases that there were uh, or improvements for workers were really hard fought and, and were a result of the wins of the activists, I think, that, that fought for them. Okay, I'm going to jump uh, in there because I, I want to make, I got to give Lori time. Gonna, I got to give Lori time on this, and then we still got the greens to go, and I'm running out of time. Go ahead, Lori. Thanks. I think that it looks good on paper, but their track record speaks for themselves. I think that the pay gap and pay transparency, for example, why not have something more concrete about pay equity? That's what's really needed. Transparency is a step in it, but it doesn't go near far enough. I think that with this government that we've had previously, um, they, as I mentioned, their track record has shown that they're not for the workers and that they should not be in government either. I think that both the current government and the Liberals have shown that same message.
Okay, let's do one more round here, and this is the Green Party and what they're promising. And we give the Greens time because, of course, they had a seat in the last Parliament and are participating in the leaders' debate as well. And uh, here we go. They've got uh, candidates in all 124 ridings as well. Expand and invest in apprenticeship and training programs. Assess costs of low-carbon, clean economy transition on workers and business. Implement a basic income guarantee that the previous government brought in and the current government scrapped. And create jobs with green retrofit incentives for businesses. Joe Mancinelli, what do you like here, or what can't you live with here? Well, you know, you're talking to uh, a leader uh, of 90,000 construction workers where the Green Party has tried to take away uh, their work through pipelines, uh, through a number of energy projects as well. And so what can I say? It kind of speaks for itself. Look at I take offense where, where people say, hey, you know, you guys, construction workers, only care about uh, the jobs. Let me tell you, my members care about the environment as much as the Green Party. Uh, the Green Party should, should start looking at, at, at the effect of some of the policies that they introduce and how they affect people and working people in this province. And so if they're trying to court labor, they're doing a very poor job. Lori, your view on the Green platform. I think it's not substantial enough to know exactly what they're thinking on all fronts. Of course, I think that the environment is something that we should be having in mind and we should be looking at how to do things differently in order to have a more uh, green economy. But I think that some of their policies are questionable that we wouldn't be very supportive of. But I think that I need to see and hear more directly from them and have a more wholesome picture. Angela. Yeah, uh, historically, the Green Party doesn't have a great uh, relationship with, with unions or workers. I personally have worked uh, over the past eight years around a just transition, and it, so I support some of the stuff that they're putting forward, but I'm not sure that they've thought about it uh, fully from, from a worker's perspective. And so uh, I'd be happy to have conversations with them to help guide them along that path. But yes, I think we need to be making investments in climate infrastructure and creating good green jobs for workers, good green unionized jobs for workers. Rocco, the leader of the Green Party, Mike Schreiner, is a former small businessman himself. Uh, what do you think he's got on offer here that you like or don't like? Look, it's impossible to dislike Mike Schreiner as an individual. Uh, he's high energy and uh, a one-man band. Um, there is a lot of missing uh, details simply because they don't have the resources that the other parties um, have. I absolutely take Joe's um, point. I, I really think there is not sufficient um, thought given to what transition looks like and making sure that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater as long as we're moving along. So I think saying that, you know, he has to look into that is, is right. And I love you know, more on apprenticeship and, and skills, because I think that is crucial to increasing uh, productivity and increasing opportunity, not just for our young people, but people mid-career to retrain and upskill. Those things are important, um, but there is a lot of detail missing in the transition to make sure it's both just and sustainable from an economic standpoint. Okay, I got 10 seconds left to ask Joe Mancinelli, who pronounced the name of his union, Leuna. But when your daughter was on this program a few months ago, she pronounced it Liuna. Who's right, Joe? I think we're both right. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with my daughter. <laughs> well said, like a proud papa. Okay, well done. Uh, that's Joe Mancinelli from Leuna, or Liuna, however you want to say it, Laborers International Union of North America. Angela McEwen from CUPE, Rocco Rossi from the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, Lori Nanskaville, OPSU. Thanks all four of you for appearing on the agenda tonight. Thank you. Thank you. There is a battle underway for the soul of Hamilton, according to writer Stephen Dale. As he outlines in his new book, the city is no longer the steel town it once was. Will it be transformed by gentrification or a more broad-based urban renewal? Stephen Dale's book is called Shift Change, Scenes from a Post-Industrial Revolution, and he joins us now from Ottawa to explain. Hi. 
I know. I really enjoyed uh, reading this book. It seems like a lot of people have this love affair with Hamilton, even though they might not live in Hamilton. Um, I mean, in recent years, Hamilton has been called Toronto's Brooklyn, uh, and the city seems to be moving forward w while contending with its past. Uh, in the book, you describe it this way. Something is happening here, but as Bob Dylan sang, we don't know what it is. Um, what were the competing narratives about Hamilton that you set out to explore in this book? Yeah, well, um, the first thing that really intrigued me was whether Hamilton was going to follow the same narrative that's been unfolding time and again in other cities across North America and around the world, where um, a, a town becomes hip, uh, a former industrial town loses its uh, uh, its uh, its former identity and and what was uh, originally considered something de classe. Uh, becomes uh, recast in the real estate narrative as uh, uh, as something gritty, as people often remark about Hamilton. And uh, the artists first co start coming in, and then others follow, and real estate prices just get completely out of control. Uh, and uh, that leads to mass dif displacement uh, of the people who used to live there, who found a safe harbor, uh, you know, people who didn't have a lot of money, who could, uh, who could live a, a decent life uh, in, in a town that was less expensive than the big metropolises, uh, those, those people get cast out. So that's the first part of the, uh, the narrative. Um, the other possible scenario is that uh, a city like Hamilton, uh, given its, uh, its history of being quite an egalitarian place of... Um, Neighbors being concerned for neighbors, of uh, you know issues of uh, you know the city wanting to the city's population people wanting to to hang together and help each other out. That maybe this could uh, uh, could lead to a different outcome where more people from different walks of life uh, have a place in the city. You know they they interact. There's a a broad fabric of society. Uh, and you know that defies the uh, experience that's that's been unfor unfortunately so much the case in other cities. And I think the situation where we're at now is that it's not really determined what the outcome is going to be. Uh, it's it's very much uh, the the coin is is in the air, and uh, where it lands is something that a lot of uh, different forces, uh, different people are trying to determine, but nobody actually knows yet. And um, towards the end of the book, you talk about uh, political will, maybe being able to navigate uh, Hamilton in one way, and the future will, uh, will will show what it ends up being. But you mentioned some things there that I want to kind of pull out from what you just said. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is this old guard in Hamilton and this new guard in Hamilton. And the idea of Hamilton as a cool, affordable place for artists to live uh, led to a lot of change in the city. You quote one person who says this about artists in Hamilton. You write, they've produced a brand for the city that was based on a previous identity that was under attack at the same moment that the redevelopers started moving in. I think the artists weren't the ones who killed or who broke the back of working class strength in the city, but they were definitely the ones who stuffed and mounted it. Is it fair to blame the artists or people who can't afford to live in Toronto for gentrification that's happening in Hamilton? Yeah, um, no, I think that they play a role, um, mostly unwittingly, in um, creating this kind of sheen around a city that in turn attracts real estate speculation that drives this whole process where a city becomes uh, unaffordable and out of reach and um, no longer a good place to live for, for people who have money. And certainly we've seen that uh, unfold. And that's the situation now in, uh, in Hamilton, certainly, where uh, there's a crisis, for instance, in rental accommodation, that the number of, there's, there's an epidemic of rent evictions uh, where uh, properties all of a sudden become uh, you know, prime pieces of real estate that speculators want to move everybody out. and. You know, we, we've seen a horrendous situation where the number of people living in encampments uh, you know, on public land uh, has, has grown enormously. So how much do artists have to do with that? Well, you know, I, I think that there's this, um, there's this 
mythology that's developed, and it is in large part um, due to uh, Richard Florida, the, the urban theorist, his views of there being a so-called creative class uh, that moves into a city, and they, uh, in Florida's view, um, bring, um, you know, the, the components of economic revival. They work in industries that are information-based or technology-based, and uh, this, this changes the whole complexion of a town, and, and a, a city that was once stagnant uh, becomes uh, a, a hive of activity and, and economic growth and, uh, and so forth. So uh, the, an interesting thing is that Richard Florida wasn't really talking about artists when he said that. Who was he talking um, about? Well, he was talking about people who work in technology industries, people who work in public relations, um, you know, people who work in, uh, uh, you know, lawyers, financiers, accountants. Uh, these are all, if you read the fine print, what Richard Florida uh, describes as, uh, as creative uh, professions, the, the creative class, so-called, that uh, is responsible for, in his earlier view, uh, revitalizing a lot of uh, decaying uh, formerly industrial cities. Um, the shift change, you suggest that there is an off-ramp. You write, there are people in Hamilton who are audacious enough to think that their one-time steel town could chart a different course and defy a market-driven narrative so commonplace and so powerful that it sometimes seems almost inevitable. It's still a long shot, they say, and the odds get worse with each day that business as usual continues. But a rare alignment of factors and some potential quirks of timing indicate that humble Hamilton might become one of the rare examples of a more equitable form of urban regeneration. What are the factors that could make Hamilton more equitable? Well, I think one of them is that because of Hamilton's history as a place where there was a lot of community involvement, uh, not just by uh, major organizations like the trade unions, but also by the people who used to own the industries in, in Hamilton, like the, uh, uh, the, the corporate captains of places like Stelco, when Stelco used to be, uh, used to be locally owned. Um, there's this tradition that, um, uh, that the community looks out for people who have fallen on hard times. Uh, you know, Hamiltonians are no strangers to uh, adverse events in their lives, uh, layoffs, uh, you know, downturns in the industry, uh, people suffering from uh, industrial accidents and, and so forth, uh, which really, you know, in, in the past, in Hamilton's blue collar past, uh, has created real hardship for people. And, you know, historically, Hamiltonians have risen to the challenge. And um, there's, there's been a lot of, of concern and a lot of initiatives uh, that have helped people out who are going through hard times. And I think, you know, present day incarnation of that is uh, a lot of community organizations uh, like the um, Hamilton Roundtable for Poverty Reduction, uh, the Social Planning Council, uh, various neighborhood organizations, and, uh, you know, uh, some, some nascent initiatives that, that aren't huge at the moment, but show a lot of potential, uh, like the Hamilton Community Land Trust, uh, you know, all of these organizations are, are working um, to develop policies that support a more inclusive vision of the city and, uh, and do things like, you know, you know build social housing uh, that, you know, although given the, the extent of the housing crisis today in Hamilton, they, they, don't, they don't, you know, it's, it's really a small initiative next to everything that's been lost. Uh, in, in the, the sphere of affordable housing. Uh, but they show a real potential. Um, there, there's a great energy in the city um, that, that if the circumstances are right, if there's a little bit of serendipity on their side, uh, that these things could actually lead to a city that, you know, defies the standard narrative of gentrification uh, and produces a city where, you know, yes, all kinds of people can still call Hamilton home, and, uh, and, and they, they have a place there.
You do get you do get that sense from the book. Um, a lot of the people that you talk about who have uh, these really uh, incredible visions for the city are dedicated to making people um, to making everybody in Hamilton finding a place for them. What does it say that they have so much love for Hamilton? Yeah, it's a really unique place, and um, I, I grew up in Hamilton myself. I moved away in 1980. And uh, I, I come back periodically since then. Uh, and, you know, I've seen the different stages that Hamilton's gone through. It was, it was really undergoing hard times in the 1990s when heavy industry was starting to fall off as, um, for instance, manufacturing uh, essentially left Hamilton. Um, but, yeah, um, you know, I, I still have a soft spot for the city. And I think that... Um, a lot of people who have stayed there, I was amazed when I started interviewing people that, uh, that there were so many, so many people who grew up around the neighborhoods that I grew up in uh, who decided to stay and sort of make the well-being of Hamilton their life's work. On the other hand, you've got a lot of people who moved into the city and, uh, you know, against the advice of, um, you know, others... Uh, from the places they came from who would say, you know, geez, why, why do you want to go to a place like that? It's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's dirty, there's no culture, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not Toronto. Um, you know, despite that, they, they came to really, like, really love the fact that, uh, you know, the people, uh, you know, although people, people as individuals are very different, that there is a certain... Uh, a certain social culture in the place where people, uh, you know, are, are open and unpretentious, and uh, you know, you can you can really connect with people in a way that you might not be able to, uh, you know, in a um, in a big city with a sort of more you know remote kind of mentality. I know that sometimes when development happens uh, and gentrification happens, it can be a very scary thing for people. Uh, it can mean different things for different people. But who benefits from uh, development? Yeah, uh, well, um, it's it's not a foregone conclusion from the outset who benefits from development. I mean, the, in the typical model, uh, you know, developers benefit from development. Uh, people with money uh, benefit from development. Um, you know, people who move in and find themselves, you know, a nice, uh, a nice place to live that they couldn't afford uh, elsewhere, uh, those people benefit. Um, but do the people who used to live in the town before it started gentrifying, do they also benefit? Well, they can. Um, when, when you have, in, in a lower income community, people with with higher incomes move in, uh, then you've got uh, a broader tax base. The, the question is, you know, how is that tax base applied? Uh, is, is the money that comes in as the city redevelops and redefines itself as quote unquote gentrification, whatever that means, and it means a lot of things when that takes place, um, when, when that money starts flowing, uh, how is that spent? Is, is that spent for things that are solely of uh, advantageous to the so-called creative class? Or is that something that supports services that everybody in the city, uh, the newcomers and the old timers alike, uh, the wealthier people and the more low income people can benefit from? So I, I think these are the things that aren't necessarily defined and determined from the outset, uh, but th they are uh, questions that are largely dependent upon that question of political will. Uh, do the politicians, does, does the city, um, do the bureaucrats uh, have that vision and the determination to stick with a vision that, uh, that, that the bounty that results from the popularity of a place like Hamilton translates into benefits across society or not? So, yeah, so we get back to this question of political will. Uh, well, speaking of political will, uh, recently a consortium, a private consortium working to develop an entertainment district in downtown Hamilton said a homeless shelter in the area does not fit with its vision. Some, including Mayor Fred Eisenberger, uh, have said that they hope the shelter can find a new home. Um, what happens to neighborhoods when essential services that are needed in the community are pushed 
published elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Well, that's something to be avoided. And, and I think, you know, my personal view on that is that even at a symbolic level, it's a bad idea to, uh, uh, to push people out, to push out services for, for low-income people or, or, or for homeless people. Uh, I, I think that that conveys a message that, um, that the people who were there before uh, were merely placeholders and they're disposable, that, uh, that they ha have no place in the, in the new city as it, as it redefines itself. And um, this, is, this is not a new story. Uh, it's, uh, it's been uh, unfolding in the past in terms of well, what happens to the waterfront. Uh, the Hamilton waterfront used to be uh, a place where there was a lot of social housing. Uh, that social housing has been neglected for a number of decades. Uh, it's in need of financing to, uh, you know, to make the necessary repairs to to make it to to make them good places to live. Uh, so there's been a, a question of, well, by the waterfront, do we keep social housing at the waterfront, or do we do we have some sort of a buyout? Move the social housing uh, elsewhere, and therefore the uh, the waterfront becomes, you know, simply a place that's reserved for for people who have lots of money uh, and will enjoy and appreciate the view. Well, you know, people who live in social housing also would enjoy and appreciate the view, and uh, and they've lived there for a long time. So, you know, that's uh, you know that's an ongoing question that that people ask, like, why is it that people who came to Hamilton a long time ago because it was inexpensive and because they could afford to live there at a time when other communities in Ontario were not making place or were not making room for lower income community. Uh, you, you know, why should they now be cast out and, uh, and have to live somewhere else where the transit is poorer, uh, they, it's perhaps a, um, they have less access to nature, uh, they have less access to the amenities that come with downtown living, for instance. Uh, so, so yeah, it's 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 not a new story uh, that, that's playing out with the Salvation Army incident. Well, um, you mentioned you know we only have a we've we have about five minutes left of our conversation, and I want to get in a few more questions. Um, mm -hmm. You you mentioned about the difficulty in finding that balance. So, how can we find a balance of growing a city? while still making sure or making space for social services and affordable housing. Is it possible to do that? Yeah, well, um, you know, a lot of the people who are working with organizations that are, that are trying to uh, create spaces or, or maintain spaces uh, for, for people uh, who don't have uh, the kind of income that, that would be required to live in the gentrifying Hamilton, uh, they've made a, a number of suggestions. Uh, there are a lot of organizations like Indwell and the Good Shepherd who have a lot of projects underway uh, to uh, to create affordable housing. Uh, there are developments that are intended as mixed income developments. Um, uh, people who I've heard recently have said that what would really be helpful is if there was some sort of taxation on uh, on landlords or developers who keep deliberately keep uh, buildings empty or keep units in buildings empty so that they can redevelop them there's there's a, a lot of space in Hamilton now uh, uh, for for people to live uh, rental accommodation that was traditionally affordable by a wider range of people um, that are actually just sitting empty as uh, as people uh, as uh, as people wait to redevelop that and and attract people who can pay higher rents, uh, so there's a, there's a wide range of practical things that can be done, uh, and, and and those you know can help ensure that. Uh, uh, that, yeah, there's space for everybody. Well, uh, since your book came out, Hamilton City Council has voted to freeze its urban boundary and to increase the density within the city. Um, Hamilton's light rail transit plan also received funding from upper levels of government. Will greater density and transit lead to more equity? Um, not necessarily. It will lead to more development. And I think one of the vexing problems that people in Hamilton have dealt with is that... Um, I mean, if you go through Hamilton, you'll see that there's a lot of empty space there. Uh, a, a lot of the old Hamilton over the pa past number of decades uh, has been leveled and, and now sits as parking lots. And people were wondering, like, why, 
a lot of the promised developments have, have not happened uh, on, on those lands. Uh, uh, one possibility that somebody in, in shift change remarked to me was that, well, maybe the people who move in to Hamilton don't move to Hamilton uh, to live in a high-rise condo. They, they move to Hamilton to live in one of the old Victorian houses uh, that, uh, that, that has a backyard and, uh, and, and you know, a, a separate sort of space, which, is, which has long been unaffordable in Toronto. So, you know, I, I think the fact that the urban boundary has, has been drawn more tightly um, means that um, there will be pressure to, uh, to build uh, in Hamilton, that there will be um, that, that these, these empty spaces or low density spaces that can be redeveloped uh, will be redeveloped. Uh, but the question as to whether that will lead to more equity, again, that's something that's not decided. Uh, it, it all depends on, you know, whether there are conditions placed on that, whether um, the new developments have a mix of, uh, of uh, accommodation for people at different income levels, and uh, whether social housing developments will, will be part of that mix. Uh, again, uh, you know, do... Uh, do the decision makers have the have the metal to uh, to be able to ensure that as redevelopment, which is much more likely, does go ahead, that that redevelopment is something that will benefit a broad range of people? Well, Stephen, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. We appreciate it. And congratulations on the book. Uh, Hamilton sounds like a terrific place where community members come together, and I can see the appeal beyond the houses. I can see the appeal of why people want to live there. Thank you so much, and congratulations. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. That is the agenda for Tuesday, May 10th, 2022. After two plus years of pandemic, mental health is an election issue as never before. Tomorrow, we'll examine the party's promises for recovery. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. TVO.org has a brand new look online. For the latest Ontario current affairs from our digital team, from the agenda, of course, and for all of our podcast documentaries and programs, check out the slick new website at TVO.org.